Καταρχήν, σας ευχαριστούμε πολύ που ήρθατε. Ε, είναι πρώτο, το πρώτο session από τα συμπόσια και η ιδέα ήταν να μαζέψουμε ε, γύρω στους 10 ομιλητές, οι οποίοι είναι αυτή τη στιγμή πολύ σημαντικοί επιμελητές ε, σε μουσεία ε, στην κοντινή γεωγραφική τοπογραφία, κυρίως από την Νότια Ευρώπη ή σχετικά από τον Ευρή Νότο, ε, έτσι ώστε να τους ακούσουμε για 15 λεπτά, μετά να γνωριστούμε και μετά να συνεργαστούμε, να αγαπηθούμε, ό,τι θέλετε. Πάντως, η ιδέα ήταν να έρθουμε κοντά με ανθρώπους που μένουν δίπλα μας και έχουν κέρυες θέσεις στον χώρο. Θα μας μιλήσουν για, τις, ε, για την επιμελητική τους μεθοδολογία, ε, με έναν έτσι πολύ ελαφρύ, φαντάζομαι, τρόπο, για 15 λεπτά, μια μικρή παρουσίαση και μετά ευχόμαστε να γίνει μια συζήτηση και να τους γνωρίσετε και από κοντά και private και όλοι μαζί. Μαζί μας σήμερα, και αυτή που θα μιλήσει πρώτη, είναι η Φιλή Παράμος, η οποία είναι κριτικός τέχνης και ανεξάρτητη επιμελήτρια. Ο, ο τίτλος της ομιλίας της είναι «Close Encounters, the fourth kind of curatorial practices or the importance of making people meet». Ε, φαντάζομαι, αν κάποιος δεν καταλαβαίνει, μου λέει ε, τι συμβαίνει. Πάντως, αυτό είναι, μιλά, θα μιλήσει για τις στενές σχέσεις μεταξύ εσάς, και την ίδια και μεταξύ του κοινού και της επιμέλειας, μεταξύ του κοινού και της τέχνης. Η δεύτερη ε, κυρία που θα μιλήσει μαζί μας είναι η Κιάρα Μπέρτολα. Είναι επιμελήτρια στο Κερίνη Σταμπάλια στη Βενετία. Για όσα από εσά θα πάνε στη Βιανάλη της Βενετίας θα έχει και, δύο εκθέσεις, ε, θα έχει και μία εκθέση εκεί και είναι και επιμελήτρια του βραβείου Φούρλα στην Πολόνια. Ε, ο τίτλος της ομιλίας της είναι «To be a curator, a matter of negotiation». I would say constant negotiation. <laughs> ε, γιατί όπως όλα τα πράγματα και αυτό είναι μια διαπραγμάτευση. Και ε, μαζί μας είναι και η Φλωράνς Ντεριέ, η οποία είναι διευθύντρια της FRAC Champagne Ardennes στην Ραν. Ε, FRAC είναι κάτι σαν κέντρο τέχνης, κάτι σαν Kunsthalle ή κέντρο τέχνης ελεύθερο στη Γαλλία. Υπάρχουν πολλά σε διαφορετικά μέρη. Ε, η Φλωράν θα μας μιλήσει για The Battle for Art, Wine and Love or How to Save the World from Parketization, which I think you mean the magazine, right? Parket magazine, you mean, uh, που είναι ένα περιοδικό τέχνης το οποίο έχει καθορίσει την τέχνη μέχρι τώρα. Are you going to say something about sex too, or? Uh, <laughs> um, well, if I could, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. If I could, I would linger forever in this precise moment. In this moment of expectation, in this threshold, and in this case is very large, the threshold, because you're very far from us. In this threshold space, which is defined between you and us, and you and me, and between your waiting and my deliverance, and between your eyes and your ears, and my mouth and my voice say because this is a moment of somehow this is the perfect moment is a moment of perfection and it's a moment in which your expectation is at its higher level um, what you're waiting for me to say is still in an almost perfect condition and Your levels of disappointment or disagreement or even of boredom, hopefully, have not yet started to be developed. Um, in this period, I still have the potential to become what you desire, to assume the shape of your desires somehow, and even to stretch the limits of your frame of reference of interest and desire. I can become even more what you desire. So here and now, in this moment, I can offer you almost everything. And that's exactly why I would very much like to extend this condition of waiting 
this condition of suspension forever. And in fact, I'm here, and I would like to thank Marina for this very kind invitation, um, because I want to share with you my thoughts on the conditions of attention in terms of the relation between attention and cultural practices, let's say, and about the conditions of observation and focus and waiting in the particular context and circumstances of the arts. And thinking about the noun, the term attention, and for once not being, not having a Greek origin, um, it comes exactly from the Latin attendere, in which we had the at, ad, which means to, and tendere, which gives the idea of stretching, of dilating something. And it gives exactly this impression of something that is stretched and dilated um, in a way which is mo mostly temporal, but that also relates to care and to effort. And this attention and this root of attend can lead us to go many different directions. I can, can lead us, of course, to wait, and I, I can say I'm attending for news, and can also take us in the direction of concentration. I can say you're being a very attentive listener, for example. But also in the sense of care. I mean, Marina has been very attentive to welcoming here, making sure that everything is okay, that we're all happy, we're being well taken care of. And also in the sense of presence, we're here because we're attending Arta Tina. And so this multifunctional condition plays a very curious role in the context of our presentation. Something that we can somehow call a distracted focus, or like Walter Benjamin called in 36, a distracted reception. Um, and being here, you and us, we're all exercising this function of attending a lecture, so you're also attentive to what I'm telling you, but you're attending for our words to give you something that you're interested in, that you want to listen to or that you hope they will be useful for something. And in my opinion, this condition of the distracted att attention, um, it becomes very special. And it, it's what gives the live encounter, the encounter of people for life, its character of uniqueness. And it's in fact one of the aspects that have more interested me, let's say, throughout my activity. And it came out when I realized that the strongest, and even more than strongest in terms of intensity, but also the most long-lasting experiences that I've been having, um, came exactly with the encounter with the other, from meeting the other, um, and from listening, from having the live narrative of what other people had to say, of what their ideas, their visions, their thoughts um, were somehow creating an impression on me. And because they were time-based and they were live, they generated an event while they were being presented. And they could not be repeated in the same way. And in fact, nothing can be compared to the intensity of a live event, which inscribes itself in our memory, in our personal memory, um, and in our collective memory, and all of us are sharing the same experience um, and creating, hopefully, a sort of a sparse community that we go everywhere having this um, same, sharing this same thing. And that's why I decided to focus in trying to make individuals, especially individuals who I felt that had something to say to each other, which is a little bit what Marina is doing here, and to make them meet. Um, and in trying to generate the circumstances for these encounters to take place in an intensive and fruitful form, 
And that's the reason for this title of the fourth kind of close encounters, which for those of you who like cinema, of course you will associate with Steven Spielberg's um, film. And, and Spielberg's film, in fact, comes from um, a, the definition of a close encounter, which is a very curious um, terminology. In fact, in ufology, that is the science that analyzes the phenomena of uh, an UFO. How do you say UFO in Greek? UFO, that's universal. <laughs> and so in ufology, a close encounter is an event in which a person witnesses an unidentified other, and especially a, a flying other, a flying object. And it's analyzed via a system of classification that was developed by the American astronomer Alan Hynek in 1972. The 70s were amazing for this kind of development. And Hynek proposed four kinds of close encounters, and we're here trying to understand the fourth. So the first kind, it had visual sightings of an unidentified object. So you, you saw something. It's very interesting because it's always related to the eye, to something that you see. Well, the second kind, it assumed there was a visual sighting, but there was also a physical evidence of this encounter. The third kind, which is the one that Spielberg um, develops in his famous film, it has sightings of not only the flying non-identified object, but also of the occupants of the object. So you saw those who were related to this object. While the fourth kind, there were humans who were kidnapped by the UFO. And this notion, and even more than notion, this feeling of this experience of being kidnapped, of being taken into something else and immersed in an experience that is overwhelming, that completely changes your perception of reality and your perception of the possibilities of the reality around you, is exactly what I believe it can happen when we generate live encounters, let's say. And simultaneously, and this is probably the most compact talk that I've ever done, so I'm doing like jumping like a giant. Simultaneously, this inquire upon the conditions of liveness and attention and of these fourth encounters um, that are possible in relation to the context of the art, um, I started a research upon the circumstances of presentation of time-based works, and in particular of artists' moving images, which led me to focus on thinking about curating cinema and curating video, and on the attempt to understand how technology, and in fact, I was hoping that Andreas Angelidakis was here because his exhibition that most of you have seen or will see at the um, then the foundation, um, there's the foundation who just did a very big. <laughs> um, it's based in um, an internet possibility. He generates his concepts based on somehow an, a website that allows us to do things. So basically, I was trying to understand how technology is changing and is changing our relation to attention. And think that St. Augustine complained that he was often distracted while he was writing. And he writes and he says that I'm writing in my studio and sometimes a little bird comes to my window and I'm distracted by that. So it makes me laugh. I mean, what would be St. Augustine today with his phone, his computer, internet, everything? And so don't come and tell me about the conditions of distracting while you're writing because you know very little about it. Um, and so I'm interested exactly in understanding how the conditions of attention and distracting are being changed and altered with technology and how encounter and how viewing things can be possible through technology. 
And that's why, um, let me see how I am in terms of time. Okay. That's, that's how a project that has been very recently developed is trying to test how we can share, how we can distribute, how we can assure the circulation of artists, films and videos, and also films and videos by experimental filmmakers can be seen and facilitated through technology and through the internet. Um, and how we can replace this feeling of I'm somewhere but I cannot see something that is being shown just for 20 days in an exhibition. And now we can make people and works, especially works of, that relate to moving image, meet via um, a platform which was launched very recently. And unfortunately, the internet here in the art fair is not very fast which is also very good because it assures that, once again, you're giving me attention because you cannot be playing with your cell phones. Um, so I cannot show you how it, the films work, everything. But basically, Vidrome is, which is done together with an art magazine from Italy called Mus. Um, and in Vidrome, we're trying to understand how we can share works and make you give some attention and allow you to see films and videos from artists that otherwise it would be very difficult to have access to. Um, see, so it's, it's not very fast, but anyway. And um, still using this um, internet platform allowing for something live to happen. So we always have a conversation between the film specialist, the critic, and the person who does the film, and trying exactly to stretch these continuous encounters and the continuous condition of liveness. So it's in a specific moment. So each film just stays there for 10 days and then is replaced by another one. So you either see it, like in the cinema, or you lose it. So it's basically this, and I think it's good that Marina invited me for the first because it's somehow a praise for the encounter and for these things to happen and see how they can happen in other places that I wanted to share with you here. I could continue talking about it for hours, but I would better not to. And so we'll have some time afterwards and just check Vidrome and, and yeah, thank you. <laughs> Dominica. Okay, uh, thank you, Philippa, for her wonderful performance, I think, <laughs> because she brings us inside her mind and her gesture in a so nice, a wonderful way that I really appreciate. And thank you, Marina, to, for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here and to try in 15 minutes to explain <laughs> my my long work that I did in Quirini Stambaglia Foundation in Venice. And if a museum is truly contemporary, it should be able to present itself differently from what we generally expect from such institution. This is Quirini Stampaglia Foundation, uh, the facade uh, on, with the in Joseph Kossuth installation that he did in 1993. Perhaps the fundamental question that should revolve around this, this process of change are the following. Is it still possible nowadays to merge art with social and cultural instances? Are those of us who, who work in museum able to represent the creative process? Can we identify themes and trends that go behind the subdivision of movement, genres, and periods? The answer to this question could perhaps lead us to conceive a museum that is capable of entering in relationship with the context by highlighting changes and by refining the strategies from displaying and exhibit so that the work of the artist come to life, to offering its space as a site of cultural production, a place in which different original language, both local and global, can take shape and find their voice. 
It was with this premise that I started the program of contemporary art at the Querini Stampaglia Foundation in Venice in 1993. From the very beginning, I had to deal with a foundation that had a very clear mission toward conservation due to its collection and a strong relationship with the past. Founded in 1869 by Conte Giovanni, Con John, the last descendant of the Venetian Querini Stampaglia family, the Querini was primarily an important library and classical art history, a key institution for the student and representation who live and study in the city of Venice. And the house museum with no real contemporary art program, despite having its interior, exterior, and garden elements designed by the Venetian architect Carlo Scarpa in the early 60s who create a very rich dialogue between and with the historic building. Therefore, when I started planning, I had to take into consideration this strong relationship with the memory of the place, with the original art collection, which includes important works by key artists uh, as Giovanni Bellini, Pietro Longhi, or Giambattista Tiepolo. I came to the conclusion that such a traditional institution could very well include in its agenda a program of completely experimental and risky events, as long as it overturned the common logic that saw the relationship with the past as exclusively conservational and static. The contemporary art project with the artist and the Quirini was born from the awareness that the relationship with the past and with tradition had to come out of a reinvented relationship and should not derived from following the formal scheme dictated by the past. Every time I invited an artist to step over the threshold of a, the, to establish a connection with a new project inside a museum space, something extremely vital and interesting emerged. The idea of unfreezing works from the past by coming in contact with the present without the fear of shattering something in this embrace open it up relational and creative possibility for the incredible depth. Things continue to have a voice if we know how to question them, and they do not only talk about the past or evoke memory, but they have the capacity to deliver something about the present and to help us imagine the future. We need to discover the old, not only as memory, but action, transformation, matter, and not immobility. The entire program at the Quirini Stampaglia Foundation is called Conservare il Futuro, Conserving the Future. It's an interesting oxymoron, in my opinion, which points out to the kind, the kind of work an institution should do. To underline this way of working with the contemporary art, I would like to go back to the talk given by Hans Huri Kobrist about considering a museum as something mobile, based on dynamic conception of our history, in which possibly imagine other new museums, innumerable other museums, are concealed if only we knew how to see them. An artist is about to do this with their work. Now I would like to show a little bit, very quickly, some images just to give you a an, an landscape and some. Okay. This is the garden of Carlos Scarpa area. This is the Carlos Scarpa area in the ground floor. Maybe something of you know this place is really, really interesting and wonderful way in which Carlos Scarpa translates, they change totally this space a turn from the past in a contemporary way for the artist. And this is the, the, the second floor is a museum collection, so you, in this way you can understand the different kind of atmosphere there are in, in, in this uh, foundation. This is the house inside the museum. It actually is a um, house museum because there is, uh, you know, the bedroom. And this is the the library in the second floor, so another atmosphere, another function of the, of the institutions. So you can understand that Quirini Stampaglia actually is not a real contemporary art museum. It was very difficult for me to try to find a way to stay in between 
and to stay and to make sense with my program and to convince my board to do to do and to trust a contemporary artist. Because this is the Pietro Longhi um, painting in the Museum of the, Con the Quirini Sampaglia. There is a big um, collection of Pietro Longhi, and I put this uh, slide because it's important because it's a reference for Kiki Smith exhibition that I did, uh, I don't remember, in 2003 on, on five, maybe. And Kiki took, for example, the, the Pietro Longhi woman, and she transform or, 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 or translate in, in, in a contemporary gesture uh, of a woman today. I need to go a little bit quickly. This is the show, Kiki Smith, uh, the Quirin, in the third floor, because in the third floor there is, there is the, the, the exhibition area, is a white, white, uh, empty area, and Kiki, the sort of mirror of a house, American house, looking downstairs, the European aristocratic house. I don't know if you can see something. The Gat. Yeah, it was an exhibition real full of grass uh, reference to the museum. And this is another, another uh, museum. Uh, uh, you <laughs> and this is the um, uh, lunch room, uh, I, I don't know how to say, the Sèvres collection is a show inside the museum. And you see in the, sem in the, in the middle of the table, the aristocratic table, the Triomfo. Uh, Triomfo uh, means uh, a sort of a little sculpture in porcelain uh, to decorate the, 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 the table. And now you see what Mona Hatum did. Took the idea from this uh, little thing. She took the monument of the uh, for, of war in, in, in the middle of the square in Beirut, and she reduced the monument uh, uh, like a, a decoration of the aristocratic table. So it was really incredible. The lot of things that the artist, uh, contemporary artist, is able to take out from the history. This is another another. Um, uh, work of Mona Hatum that Mona did inside the, the museum. Uh, this is a bomb, different kind of shape of bomb. And she put inside a very cabinet, a very precious cabinet, like a, a jewels, like something very precious. And when you see closer, you understand it is a bomb. It was so interesting. This is the Mona, the third floor, so you can understand a different kind of uh, atmosphere and, 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 and space that normally I give to an artist to make an exhibition in Querini because they, it took time. I give a lot of time for an artist to stay in relationship with the past, of, of course, the history and the space. And, um, but I think it's, it's interesting this, uh, this different. This was Kabakov. Um, Actually, Kabakov is 2003. Uh, is a, um, the title of the exhibition is already in the meaning of the exhibition is uh, what is our place uh, between the past and the present and the contemporary, of course. And, okay. Uh, see, this is the Georgia de Akbo, just to give you some another example. An African artist uh, came inside the museum, inside our culture and did a lot of different things. This is a sort of fresco. But inside the museum was absolutely interesting what uh, George uh, did. For example, with the masterpieces by Giovanni Bellini, you see on the right, and the other Giovanni Bellini that uh, George Adeacqua did with the artisan from in Benin, like a sort of postcard for us, to us. It's really, really interesting. And so, that's it. <laughs> I think it's, it's very important. I put in my title, the negotiation is very important, you know, because it's, I think the negotiation is a cohabitation between the old and contemporary. It does not mean carving a new space inside the museum. 
The objective is to create a new space, transforming and translating the role that regulates a museum into something more human, true and alive. We have seen how important the concept of negotiation in and how many negotiations we continuously activate with the space, with order, with time and with everyday life. I think that primarily a sort of negotiation we ourselves is necessary. We need to change our assumption all of the movement. Making a space inside one's head is like a refurbishing room. It means entering a new realm of possibilities. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. And well, thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, Marina, for the invitation and for Artetina and the team, obviously. Um, the Battle for Art, Wine and Love, yes, that was a very strange title. So that, let me explain. <laughs> Let's keep the, the, the mystery immediately. I was reading this book at the time, which actually is in French, while the book was written by an American journalist called Alice Fearing. And uh, she wrote this book called The Battle for Wine and Love, or How I Saved the World from Parkerization. So it's not Parker Magazine, I didn't think of this. It's, but it's Parker, this um, very famous wine uh, critic, American wine critic. And um, this book actually, uh, in this book, Alice Fearing talks about how uh, an entire industry, the wine industry, was changed. Um, and highly changed within a matter of a few years, and mostly by one person only, this Mr. famous Mr. Parker, who, uh, because of his um, very influential taste in wine, changed the entire production worldwide, and obviously also in France. You know us French people who are very sensitive when it comes to talking about food and wine, so it's, um, it's a book that was very um, successful in France. She um, is a wine, uh, she, I'm not going to talk more longer about this, but she's a wine um, critic herself. And uh, her uh, book turns around the idea that at some point, um, because of Mr. Parker's taste, which is a very um, uh, peculiar taste in wine, which wine lovers, real wine lovers would not like, the whole production came from being a very authentic production of wine. You take grapes and you make wine and it's pretty natural and authentic. It came to um, create a whole industry based on faking, faking uh, the taste of uh, the wood uh, in the big, um, I'm lacking the vocabulary here for wine in English, but uh, you know, um, yeah. He, he, Mr. Parker likes very uh, fake wines, um, and therefore the whole production came from being very authentic and natural into something completely uh, using even chemicals to give taste, etc. It's a fascinating book, it has nothing to do with art, but what happened is that um, when I was reading it, I really thought, uh, for many reasons, that was a perfect... Um, this title, uh, if I was adding art in it, would perfectly represent what I've been experiencing, let's say, in the past five years. Five years ago, I became the director of um, the Frac Champagne Den. It's a public institution in France based in Reims. That's where wine comes into the conversation. It's in the Champagne city. So wine is the art in the whole area and there's no other art. <laughs> there is one institution for contemporary art, which has been created um, almost at the same time all, as all the other institutions of this kind, because FRAX, which stands for Fonds for Contemporary Art, FRAX were created in France in 1982 under the impulsion of the state, together with all the regions. So there is one FRAC in each region in France. They were created in 82, the Frac Champagne then was created in 84. And as I said, um, it's a region that really is interested in, uh, in culture, but everything turns around wine. That's the first step of my battle. 
that's what, for the battle as well. Um, I'm not going to talk about love. I was, as I said, hoping something <laughs> would be entering the conversation later, but uh, actually, actually I have to leave love again. But um, no, to be serious, it's just, um, it's a battle to be running an institution which is uh, the unique institution representing contemporary art in a region that doesn't really have great interest in contemporary art. It's uh, a battle to be uh, working on a very local level. I will explain more about what we do with the FRAC. But we work in the entire territory of the region. It's very challenging to be working on a very local level and at the same time being an element um, of the art world as well. So it's an international uh, community in the good days and business uh, in the bad days. I don't know. Um, it's a very interesting battle to have as goal to be uh, educating, sensibilizing, we say, a whole population in a country where um, artistic education doesn't exist. What I mean by this is that we are not learning art history in school in France, even today. It comes, it comes very difficult to address contemporary art issues with people who don't even know about the, the history of art. That's what I mean precisely. Um, and um, when I was considering the questions that uh, uh, Marina was asking um, about what is the object of contemporary curating or obviously it all came together that uh, the Frac Champagne then for me for the past five years is really a case study. It's a case study of what we do as curators and on a personal level it's a case study for every question I was asking myself or not asking myself rather up until I decided to um, take over this institution. So the funny, the funny story is that I was pretty quiet living in Switzerland and I decided that I wanted to make my life difficult in 2008. 2008 was the beginning of the crisis, I'm not teaching you anything here, and um, becoming the director of a public institution in such a region was already very challenging. 2008 made clear that it would be very difficult so um, when it comes to talk about the conditions, well, I'm going to, anyway, go back to my um, program, which was to uh, let you know about this institution and how peculiar it is. It's not a museum, it's not an art center, uh, although we have an exhibition space and we have a collection. It's a completely hybrid institution. And when I say it's a case study, it's each frac is extremely different because they were shaped by all the, I mean, the director, all the directors that um, worked in them uh, for more or less time. Um, if I go back to my battle, it's, um, it was interesting to consider such a tool and try to create a special place for artists to work, obviously, um, and think of what does it mean to, make a, to create an, a nice place for an artist to be working. But not only this, but what it comes to uh, being working within a community, and a large one when it comes to such a big territory. And when the main question is to reach or create a dialogue with not a certain kind of publics, but the largest public possible. When it comes to the scale of a city or the scale of a region, it becomes very, very fascinating how um, suddenly everything becomes difficult and seems like a huge mountain uh, to climb every day. Um, okay, so. Just to make it quick, because we have little time, I thought of showing you um, this, uh, sorry, to showing you this um, exhibition with me, because the link I would like to make is to come to talk about 
um, independence. So first, before I talk about independence, I want to let you know about what we do in these institutions. Uh, so, uh, as I said, we are operating as an art center. We organize exhibitions. We invite artists to produce artworks, to produce exhibitions. But we also have a collection. Um, and the goal is to circulate this collection as much as possible within the territory, which means that we are exhibiting in every single possible space, public, private um, exhibition spaces, or schools, or hospitals, or even, we don't do that, but m most of the fracs do even exhibitions in jail, in prisons. Um, every single public space, public, uh, a space that attracts publics, is potentially a place where we should, or we are, told we should exhibit the collection. So that's the first issue, is do we really want to do that? What's probably the first question I ask myself. And I'm very lucky because I um, came to direct an institution which was directed by very, very snobbish people before me. And that really helps. Because when you come to this context and you really don't want to make an exhibition in a prison or an exhibition in a horrible place, it helps to have people before you who actually said, no way, we're never going to do that in Champagne Arden. And the champagne helps as well. Because when you drink champagne or when you're in the champagne industry, there is something a bit chic about this that really prov pro you know, provide um, a good, um, I don't know, a way of doing, no, this is not a good idea. More seriously, the first question uh, is to ask, uh, we ask ourselves is, it's okay to exhibit this politics is very interesting. The idea of the creation of the FRAX was actually a certain population on a given territory probably doesn't have the possibility, all of them probably don't have the possibility to travel to Athens or to travel to London or New York or Tokyo or even Paris. And we are 45 minutes away from Paris, but the train cost a fortune. So not everybody is able to travel to visit an exhibition. But of course, the idea before that is, um, who are these people who are actually thinking of going to visit an exhibition? So you're constantly asking you the most basic questions. Not everybody co coming out from uh, the educational system, if one did go to the, uh, did follow the educational system, not everybody will actually think of, my, I might be interested in seeing an exhibition of contemporary art. What is contemporary art? This is the most difficult. So, but we are, are working on this level, but we have this exhibition space where people who actually are interested in contemporary art might want to come and see our exhibitions. But constantly we are negotiating everything and rethinking everything. So the first, um, well, I was saying since 2008, uh, fortunately, I was not 20 years old anymore. I had um, worked in very different places, museums, galleries. So I had a bit of um, food uh, to think of what I wanted to do. My first decision was to work exactly the same way in Champagne Arden as I was or I would work in the art world or for um, you, like for the, the public of art, contemporary art. I decided to stay in the same, exactly on the same level and don't change anything about the way we work. I decided to, as I said, um, address uh, this issue of showing the collection in every possible public space. What we do is we actually negotiate with the, with, we create partnerships. We have, um, yeah, sorry. It's true, it's a chal challenge. So I'm going to show you images of exhibitions with it at the same time as I speak. Um, let's pretend it's a, a slideshow. Um, uh, no, it's not going to be possible, sorry. Um, yeah, so th these questions. There are many more, but uh, just for you to understand how we operate, 
uh, that's what we do. What I um, wanted to actually talk about, how many minutes do we have left? Do I have left? <laughs> it's over, okay. Well, by, I wanted to come to um, talk about, as I said, about independence. Um, starting with um, the idea of, is, the, is it possible really to operate in such a way on a given territory, try to reach, um, match uh, systematically the local and the global that we've been discussing endlessly? Uh, is it possible to reach the largest public possible? Is it possible in an institution which is public, as we said, in a moment of crisis, with uh, all the budget cuts, and the Fraction Pagnardin is uh, one of the fracs which has the, le the, the smallest budget in the country. Everything is really dependent on this, obviously. So how do you have um, an international program in an institution in such a context um, with very limited budget? What does it mean in the end um, to create uh, a space which is a good space for artists and for the public to, for, for artists to work and for the public to discover contemporary art or to get to know more about contemporary art in such a given uh, context? How can one institution can keep uh, an independence in terms of research, of um, experimentation in terms of choice, of artistic choice. When it comes to uh, produce exhibitions with artists um, who are, have a, I don't know, um, are demanding in, uh, in such a, on such a level in terms of uh, finances. When it comes to finance an exhibition, when you're operating from such an, ex this is actually the institution. Um, you have to negotiate with um, other partners uh, to find different or various uh, source of financing to produce these exhibitions. So when it comes to independence, it's the, really the main question I'm asking myself right now, after five years operating. So the, how can one continue to uh, choose to do absolutely what we want to do and only what we want to do in terms of presentation of uh, art to a population. I'm going to, yeah, um, Marina is looking at me, so I think I'm going to make it really quick. Um, sorry, to just finish with this. This is a program of exhibition which um, everybody refers to my program of exhibition since 2008 as basically, wow, you. It looks like you do everything you want. Yes, I've been able to do everything I want. Every exhibition I've done, one after the other, came out of my own interest. And together with the acquisition committee, uh, the interest we developed together for the collection as well. I'm not sure that this is going to last for long, but this is something I wanted to discuss with you today. Thank you so much for your attention and sorry for Sorry, because I know it's a difficult it exercise, work. 15 minutes, but also thank you for your time. I will switch to Greek. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ που ήσασταν εδώ και ακούσατε, δώσατε τόσο χρόνο μέσα σε μία art fair για αυτές τις ομιλίες. Και επίσης, άμα θέλετε, έχουμε λίγο χρόνο, ίσως λίγο συμπιεσμένο, να κάνετε κάποια ερώτηση στους ομιλητές. Εγώ θα κάνω ένα πολύ πολύ γρήγορο, σε μία πρόταση, αν μπορώ. Αυτό που ακούσαμε ήταν Ε, ε, ο βαθμός σχέσεων που μπορεί να, να αποκτηθεί ανάμεσα από τους ομιλητές, τους curator, τους, τους επιμελητές, τους καλλιτέχνες και το κοινό, γενικά ο βαθμός σχέσεων. Ακούσαμε για την ανεξαρτησία που μπορεί να έχει ένας επιμελητής με συντέχνη, αν μπορεί ή όχι. Και ακούσαμε και για τη σχέση που μπορεί να έχει το τοπικό και το παγκόσμιο, το, η, η, αν θέλετε, μια πιο ιστορική ας πούμε, άποψη της τέχνης με τη σύγχρονη τέχνη. I just made a very round up of what we said about independence, relationships, history and contemporary art. 
and you know if there are questions and if you want to ask in Greek I can always uh, translate your question to our lovely ladies <laughs> very strong ladies thank you Hello, my name is Katerina Kitsili. I'd like to address my question to you, Mrs. Derrier. What was your vision when you changed places from Switzerland to France? Well, it's, I think it's age at the beginning, huh? because I was really quiet. I could have stayed there, and I thought I need to do something, and I need to do something obviously in my own country. And at that moment, I already saw how public institutions were pretty much in danger. I mean, I'm always, I'm a Mediterranean, so I'm always exaggerating, but um, I, today we know that I was not exaggerating. The budget cuts are also coming to France now. We all have cuts. France was pretty much safe and it's, it's gone. Also, peop, you know, politicians are really questioning the international uh, directions of programs from some of my colleagues, which is, you know, crazy because in France, this institution allowed us to create um, a huge national uh, collection which is completely international. It's very unique to, to that country. Uh, what changed my, is my vision, my vision is that I was more or less working with museums previously. So this was important for me to continue. How you share, that's, that's the love part of my talk that I didn't really have the time to address. I wanted to be serious, but uh, it's really about uh, how you share your passion with your community. And the community can be a given community. Originally, I'm not from Champagne Ardennes. And when you actually start working somewhere, you develop this kind of uh, sharing uh, of knowledge, sharing of passion, sharing of love, probably, because you need one, you need some um, when you're working. So this, this, the, my vision is that before, I thought that this uh, politic this uh, cultural politics could function. Today, I see what doesn't allow it to allow it to function. That's the main change in my vision. Marina Kanaka Kimelen. Je m'appelle Marina. Je suis française aussi. Emma Elinor Alida. Ronorisi arke tous dascalus kalanternon sto Paris sto sinecol de Bosa. J'ai rencontré beaucoup de profs de Bozar en France, Velikovic, Piazzolis. Que olhe mulher, né? O que calitere, calitere tus mafites, e tania elines. Por conta do meu Erasmus. O pote posso exigir te, a fune seguro te se nela dar me excelente técni, sincroni, que é pisi sincroni, pela de geografiki, geografiki, me fuvere silojes. Professor, já me vi aí na documentaria do Felio, me fuvere siloji. Ala que Δέστε, δηλαδή σύγχρονα. Και αντί δεν υπάρχει περισσότερο ενδιαφέρον από την Ευρώπη για τους Έλληνες καλλιτέχνες. Για την ελληνική τέχνη που είναι αντάξια της παγκόσμιας τέχνης αυτή τη στιγμή και μπορεί και κάποιες φορές καλύτερη. Yeah, it's for you a question. Uh, well, from our side, I think it's pretty obvious. We have a great interest in the, the Greek art scene. Marina is a great friend and we follow, uh, I mean, she's a main uh, source of information for me. But uh, what makes you think that there is not an interest? Generally, in France and Europe, they, they have no idea about what is happening here. But when I meet people, uh, in, in Greek or in, or in uh, English, mm. because it's a pity that uh, um, I'm an art historian too, and I've met lots of people in France, for example, that they don't know at all about Greek art today, but when they learn about Greek art today, they, say, they find it amazing. And they say, but it's, it's uh, sometimes better that lots of things we can see in the whole Europe. Why? Why do they think in, in Greece there is no, nothing happening? Why? It's just a pity. I believe that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know, I know your problem. I think the problem is because there, is no st there was never a state help on the back of uh, Greek artists. And the local collect collectors, which are very big and very important, are very provincial in a sense. 
they only invest in foreign artists because they care for their status, international status. So nobody really helped the artists in a way. Let's, we can finish it here because it's a long situation and talk. And I think mainly it's because there was no um, support behind and that makes artists to produce bad work often. So it's a, like a vicious circle because, yeah, artists in Greece can be very lazy, but when nobody supports you, you know, you can be very lazy. So I think it's uh, both, that this is my opinion, you know, I'm, I'm saying, you know. But anyway, this is a big topic. We have to have a break now. So see you back in about uh, 20 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>